Um, we are partnered with the South Central AHEC, and you can see our mission statement listed there. We want to take a moment to thank everybody who's joining us here in person and those who are also joining us through Zoom. Um, as we go ahead again, if you could please make sure if you're on Zoom that your microphone is muted. Also for all who are in attendance, if you can remain uh, um, engaged in the session. If you do have questions, please be sure to put those in the chat box and I'll be keeping an eye on that. Um, we do, we are trying something new here for those in person. There is a, a half sheet in front of you or near you. Um, if you could please use the first QR code there to sign in. It's just gonna ask you for your name, um, your credentials and your email address. If you can make sure you do that, we do need to keep attendance records um, for our grand rounds. And then um, towards the end of the session, I will be putting the other QR code um, in the chat box for the Zoom participants but I will also have it there on the sheet um, for those who are in person. Um, it's the QR code to the right. We're gonna ask for feedback for our speakers once we've completed the session. So just a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, so as we get started, those who do choose to claim CME credit, please utilize the code listed here. That is our code for today. Um, make sure that you do this before midnight tonight and I'll go through some additional instructions here on the next slide. So if you have not yet registered with the CME office, um, reach out to me first. Um, my name is Nicole Rubio. You can see me after the session or I will put that information in the chat box as well. Um, but once you have registered with the CME office, you'll just need to register your account by texting your email address to the toll-free number listed. Um, after that, once you've registered completely, you can then just text, uh, text attend and then today's code, which is listed here, um, to the toll-free number. Just make sure, again, as I mentioned earlier, you do that before midnight tonight. If you are claiming credits, please make sure to visit the CME website every so often to check your transcript and to see that those credits are showing up. Um, but if you have any questions, you can reach out to them or you can reach out to myself as well. Um, we also do offer credits through the AAFP if you are a member. Um, so keep that in mind as well. Um, but you are welcome to reach out to me or you can reach out to them also. So it is our goal to cover these nationally established physician core competencies that you see listed. And we do want to make sure that we um, provide the disclosures um, Dr. Tavares is a consultant for Galt Pharmaceuticals, and Dr. Ojeda has no financial rela relationships with ineligible companies to disclose. So they are here today to talk to us about common oral conditions and what to do about them, and I'll let them go ahead and get started here. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you, everyone, for being here this afternoon. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm David Ojeda. I'm a dentist. Uh, I'm an oral medicine specialist. Uh, maybe you are not super familiar with the discipline of oral medicine, but oral medicine uh, is one of the 11 dental disciplines. Um, it's considered like the interface between medicine and dentistry. We don't do really any, any dental procedure. We do more like um, the diagnosis and management and treatment of conditions affecting the mouth, but not the, 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 the teeth. So we um, we deal with patients with mucosal diseases, also with patients with salivary gland pathology and patients with uh, TMD or temporomandibular disorders or orofacial pain. Um, we wanted to thank you all for the opportunity of, to present today. I will assume that you don't have dentists presenting to you that often, so we really appreciate this opportunity. And um, I will let I will let Dr. Tavares to to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Tiffany Tavares. I'm also um, an oral medicine specialist. We're both at the UT um, Health School of Dentistry. We have an oral medicine clinic um, over there where we see these patients with these oral mucosal disorders and oral facial pain conditions. So if you ever encounter something weird in the mouth that you're not sure what to do about, we're gonna cover some of the common things and some uncommon things, you feel free to refer them over to us. We'll be happy to work together with you um, to manage these patients. Thank you. Okay, so let's start. Um, 
before I start, I, I have to tell you that you are going to see a lot of pictures of mouth. So if you are sensitive or you are eating or something, you can just close your eyes. Um, as much as I would like to go fast over those pictures, we have a bunch of them. So just wanted to let you know. So I wanted to talk a little bit about medicine and dentistry. And our profession has been historically separated for many different reasons. Um, but now the understanding of oral health and the impact in systemic health, um, we, we understand those relationships better. Okay, this is a bi-directional uh, relationship where the oral health is gonna have an impact on systemic health and vice versa. So um, again, for, for many different reasons, oral health has not been a priority in the medical curriculum, but we have more in common that we think we do, right? So this particular study found that 25% uh, of the competencies between the medical curriculum and the dental curriculum overlap. Um, so there are plenty of opportunities for collaboration. Um, so one of the reasons why we wanted to, to come here and present about these conditions is because we often get patients that are referred to us by you guys, primary care physicians or other medical specialties, or sometimes the patients, they come to us and they have seen you before and they don't have a definitive diagnosis or treatment. So you are going to keep receiving patients coming to you for oral conditions. And that, that we can explain that because some patients are going to have difficulties accessing dental providers in their areas. The ratio, um, the dentist population is just, um, it's off. And also because some patients might have dental insurance, medical insurance, but not dental insurance. So when something is affecting their mouth, by default, they will go to you first, expecting them for, for you to solve or diagnose or treat their conditions. And sometimes you don't have the knowledge or the expertise or don't really know where to refer the patient. So the idea of today's presentation is to uh, talk about the most common conditions that we think that you can receive, that patient can go to your practice and uh, to give you like the tools for diagnosis and initial management. And also you can learn a little bit more about what we do and feel free to send your patients to us. If you happen to practice here in the San Antonio area or South Texas, we have the an oral medicine clinic as part of the services of UT Health Dentistry. And our services, the, the oral medicine services, to be honest, is not a super common service that you can, you can go to any hospital or, or city and you will see an, a, a, an oral medicine, a, an, oral, an oral medicine service. We only have six, um, residency programs in the whole nation. And I believe that we are like 400 specialists. So it's kind of rare, or I will say unique. Um, so if you have patients like this and you don't have an oral medicine in your area, I would recommend to send your patients to any dental school because maybe they might have a pathologist. We do a slightly different things, but at least the patient can, can get their concerns taken care of. So um, I was talking about medicine and dentistry and here at UT, we have some opportunities now that interprofessional education is everywhere. Um, interprofessional education is defined um, as a students from two or more professions learning from and with each other to enable effective communication and collaborations and improve health outcomes. And this has proven to, to improve satis satisfaction in the patients and also in the providers. So here um, you, we have a couple of pictures. In the first picture, you see one of the dental students doing the cranial nerve examination in one of the um, standardized patients. And in the other picture, you see the dental students are teaching the medical students how to do the head and neck examination. So. Again, that's the most basic thing, the may, maybe the minimal competency that a dentist and a physician should have. And uh, we wanted to emphasize the importance is a, is a patient come to you with an oral concern, okay? So take a look of the mouth. It's not that difficult. The only thing that you need to do is to have a systematic uh, 
a system to do it step by step so you don't oversee anything. Remember, the mouth is more than just teeth. We have the palate, the hard palate, the soft palate, the, the lips and the lip mucosa and the vocal mucosa, the tongue, the floor of the mouth, salivary glands and all that. And from any of those sites, pathologies, pathology can rise, right? So the only thing that you really need is just to have a couple of gauze and maybe you won't have a dental mirror in your in your equipment, but you can use a tone depressor and a good source of light and that will help you to take a, a good look of the mouth and, 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 and assess what's going on. So we are going to start talking about a couple of conditions that are not really pathologic, but you might have patients coming to you asking what's going on. I feel this, I, I just found this in my mouth and, and I don't know what it is. So one very common condition that we see, and sometimes we get referrals, not only from physicians, but also from other dental providers is geographic tongue, okay? Geographic tongue is a chronic inflammatory condition of unknown etiology. We don't know why this happened. This is a benign condition. It's fairly common, affects one to two percent of the population with a slightly female predilection, and it's more commonly seen in patients uh, that are atopic or patients that have first degree relative that are atopic too. It's characterized by these like red patches that you can see in the pictures and you will see a white border that is kind of a serpigen, uh, has a, like a serpiginous shape or something like that. So this, these red patches that we see in the pictures, I don't know if you can see my pointer, yes, you can. Um, this is like, these are the filiform papilla it's this is atrophy of the filiform papilla and then this is the normal tongue here so what is interesting about this condition most of the patients are going to be asymptomatic but some of them can report sensitivity especially to us to acidic citrus or spicy food when i was doing my residency and, 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 I'm, and I'm gonna be telling you stories about things that I have seen in my patients because I think it's interesting. So when I was doing my residency, oral medicine is a hospital-based residency program, right? That's not super common for dentistry. And um, I remember I was on call one week and we got a call like in the middle of the night because they admitted a patient, I think that was an 18 year old uh, male that reported excruciating burning sensation on the tongue. And when we went there, the patient had just burning mouth syndrome. So some patients are going to be asymptomatic, but some patients can be very sensitive and symptomatic. Actually, this case was actually reported in the Journal of uh, Medical Emergencies. Um, so when we have patients with um, geographic tongue, we Often can see the patient has also fissure tongue. If you pay attention to this tongue, you can see these maybe deep fissures here. Again, these are not pathologic conditions. These are very common, but patients might found this in their mouth and they don't know what it is or they start experiencing symptoms and they, they might come to you. Um, Sometimes these conditions can be confused by candidiasis or lichen planus just because of the white lines that you can see on the tongue. But one important thing about the geographic tongue is that it's going to change patterns, okay? This condition is also called uh, benign migratory gositis, okay? So the migratory part comes because these lesions move around. So sometimes the lesion is going to be on the right, on the left, on the ventral tongue. Sometimes they don't even have anything. And these series of pictures that we're showing here is the same patient over a period of time where you can see how the lesions looks different. I don't know. I will say that this is a month, okay? So be careful or, or be mindful that the patient might tell you sometimes I have have it. Sometimes it's bigger, sometimes it's sensitive, and sometimes it's not. So that might be a geographic tone case. So when you get the patient, maybe the patient doesn't have, when you get the patient in, 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 in your office, maybe the patient doesn't have active lesions that day, but they swear that something is going on in their mouth and they feel these things. So look for the fissures because if the patient has fissured tongue, most likely the patient also have geographic tongue, but the lesions are not present by the time that you are going to see the patient. Okay. Other condition that is very common is hairy tongue. And hairy tongue is going to be present in the dorsal tongue most of the times towards the first third or the mo most posterior third of the tongue. And we will see this coated 
on the tongue that simulates like hair and that's actually uh, prolonged papilla, the keratin in the most superficial layer of the epithelial cell doesn't get like detached or desquamated and makes the, the papilla to look longer. And sometimes these um, elongated papilla looks like hair and they can have different colorations. That's going to depend really if the, if the patient is taking any particular medication, diet, habits, smoking, and things like that. Sometimes it looks very dark and it can look even black or gray or brown or yellow. And sometimes patients use um, oral hygiene products that are very, very strong and also can cause these type of reactions on the tongue. Again, this is not pathologic. This is actually considered a variation of normal. Um, so for the management of this condition is just gentle mechanical desquamation, what the, we instruct the patient just to brush their tongue with a very soft bristle toothbrush, maybe once a day, or they can also use a tongue scraper, but maybe only once a day. They don't have to do it super hard because if they do it super hard, they're going to produce more keratin. It's like creating a callus on your tongue, right? So just keep the mouth hydrated and clean, and that also helps with this condition. Now we're going to talk about a group of conditions that are actually pathologic conditions are very, very common, at least for in, in our practice. And these one actually require intervention and, and, and care. So the first one is um, lichen planus or a lichen planus. As you know, lichen planus is an immune mediated uh, type for hypersensitivity reaction. And with lichen planus, we can have cutaneous skin manifestations, oral manifestations, genital, genital manifestations. Some patients only present with skin lesions. Some other patients only present with mucosal lesions, but a group of them can present with both. What's important about lichen planus, lichen planus is actually considered a pre-malignant condition with a, a malignant transformation rate of 1.4%. And, and that's important because remember, this is a chronic condition. So those patients eventually can develop a pre-malignancy or sometimes cancer. This uh, condition, oral lichen planus, is more common in middle-aged uh, females. And 10% and of them are going to have lesions in the skin and 20% of them are going also to have lesions in their genitals. We have different type of lichen planus. We have different patterns, I would say. The most common type of lichen planus is the reticular lichen planus. Reticular lichen planus is going to be this first pic picture of the, the cheek or buccal mucosa, where you see all those white lines um, in going in all directions like the lazy pattern. And we also have the erosive lichen planus, where the patient is going to present with erosions and ulcerations. Again, this is an immune-mediated reaction, so most likely it's going to be generalized. It can affect the buccal mucosa or the cheeks, but it can also affect the gingiva. When the erosive type affects the gingiva, we call that um, the squamative gingivitis. So for a patient to be diagnosed with lichen planus, the lesions should be bilateral, and most of the time, somewhat symmetric. And these are chronic conditions. So these conditions are going to uh, have peaks. Sometimes the patient is going to be fine. They're going to have good days, good weeks, good months, but they can also have bad days, but bad weeks and bad months. And one of the things that we know about like in planus even though this is kind of an internal process because it's immune mediated, a lot of external factors can play a role exacerbating or triggering the, or triggering the condition. So these patients are going to be very sensitive to a spicy, acidic, citrus, especially cinnamon, peppermint, garlic, red wine, certain chocolates, certain medications can exacerbate this for patients. Emotional and physical stress can also do exacerbate um, these conditions in the patient. Depending on the type that the patient is presenting, this can be very sensitive or not sensitive at all. Uh, the reticular pattern, which is the most common one, is asymptomatic. The patient, they don't even know they have it, but maybe sometimes they are doing an examination on, the, on themselves or they're looking at something else and they found all those white lines that they might seek um, uh, evaluation help for, for their condition. But the erosive lichen planus is 
more severe because the patient is going to have the sores and ulcers, erosions in the mouth, and of course, it's going to be more painful. The diagnosis of these conditions is based on the clinical diagnosis is based on the medical history. We ask a battery of questions that are going to help you to figure it out what's going on, and also the clinical examination. Most of these cases are, are they present with a classic pattern, and we don't need to do a biopsy really. But in some cases, we, when the patient especially presents with erosive lichen planus affecting the gingiva that I said before that we call that the squamative gingivitis, we need to rule out other vesiculobulous disorders like mucous membrane pemphigoid or pemphigus vulgaris. So in those particular cases, we might decide to do a biopsy. Some of the differential diagnoses include lichenoid hypersensitivity reactions and lichen planus and lichenoid uh, hypersensitivity reactions are two different things. Lichenoid hypersensitivity reactions is more related to something that the patient might be putting in their mouth. It's going to be a local reaction to something. Lichen planus is going to be something systemic. Um, lupus, it's it's going to be another important differential diagnos diagnosis here. And as I said before, pemphigos and pemphigoid. Uh, sometimes proliferative verrucous leukoplakia, Dr. Tavares will talk uh, about that uh, in a little bit, and graft versus host disease. So lichen planus is actually very common. I always tell my students and my patients, if I have seven, if I, if I have 10 patients a day, at least seven of them are going to have lichen planus. Uh, for the treatment, it really depends if the patient is symptomatic or not. If the patient doesn't have any treatment, we don't really treat these patients, but we make them aware that this is an, a pre-malignant condition. So even though they feel great, they should come to see us at least once a year because there are chances that this can be a cancer at some point. And if the patient is symptomatic, we treat these with topical steroids. Depending on the clinical presentation, we might choose from... Uh, dexamethasone solution or elixir for the patient to use it as a mouthwash if the patient has lesions in different sites of the mouth, or maybe the patient has only a simple lesion in the lateral border of the tongue or the vocal mucosa, maybe it's just easier to apply a paste or a gel. We can use fluocinonide or clobetazole. For some other cases that require systemic therapy, uh, we could prescribe hydroxychloroquine uh, or plaquenil. What is important is that these therapies that we're presenting here are off-label, but we have been using them for, for, for a long time and they are pretty effective. Now, Dr. Tavares will talk to you about leukoplakia. Thank you. All right, so switching gears a little bit, but um, kind of in the same vein where we were talking about lichen planus um, being an oral potentially malignant disorder. Um, I'm going to jump off that a little bit. Well, in lichen planus, if you read position papers on that, there's a subtype that's called plaque type lichen planus, and there's this great debate on whether that exists for real or not. But because sometimes you can see plaques appearing within lichen planus, and there's this, this debate of, if, is it lichen planus? Or are we actually dealing with a leukoplakia? Um, because you, so a leukoplakia, what the World Health um, Organization defines that as, so you guys can read it, I'm gonna take the, the banner out of the way, is a white plaque of questionable risk having excluded other known diseases or disorders that carry no increased risk for cancer, meaning it's a diagnosis of an exclusion characterized by a well-defined white plaque. So we have to rule out all other things that may appear as a white plaque in the mouth. And that becomes tricky, right? Be because there are many things in the oral cavity that can appear white. And we just looked at one of them that is um, lichen planus, right? And lichen planus is considered an oral potentially malignant disorder, right? Okay, but so leukoplakia is the most common oral potentially malignant disorder. And we see leukoplakia is occurring um, in patients who have a history of tobacco use, of alcohol use, um, patients uh, who use areca nut, um, exposed to UV, if we're talking about leukoplakias on the lip. Um, and the older you are, the more likely um, you are to develop leukoplakias. 
The entire pathophysiology is poorly understood, but it's driven by multiple genetic, epigenetic alterations. Um, they're trying to, now there's a lot of research going on to characterize genomically these leukoplakia, but very heterogeneous. Um, and what we, so the leukoplakia is a clinical diagnosis, right? Because we've ruled it out, it's a, we've ruled out all other etiologies, so it's based on the clinical features. But once we have a leukoplakia, we must take a biopsy to determine whether dysplasia is present or not. But the fact that you have a leukoplakia, it is already considered an oral potentially malignant disorder. Okay. And within a leukoplakia, you could have a cancer already, but it is a clinical diagnosis. Um, the estimated prevalence is 1.7 to 2.7%. And if we were to group all types of leukoplakia together, the annual risk for malignant transformation is 2 to 3%. Um, the male to female ratio depends on geographic distribution. Um, but it's more frequent in older individuals and the U in the US more common after the age of 40. But here, if we're looking at these pictures, we have different types of leukoplakia here. So um, here we can see on the pa hard palatal mucosa right around uh, these, these molars, um, a very varicose, it's hard because it's not that zoomed in, but you see how it's very sharply demarcated, like I can tell where it starts and I can tell where it ends. It's almost like someone drew this on. For all of these, you can tell it's very sharply demarcated, very thick, very white. Um, here, this one is more disorganized, right? So we can have a homogeneous leukoplakia, we can have a non-homogeneous leukoplakia. They can be very thin, they can be very thick, um, they can have a varicose pattern. Um, we can have erythroleukoplakias, that would be a type of non-homogenous where you have a white component and you have a red component coexisting. That is very worrisome. So if we're talking about different types of risk, a homogenous has a lower risk and a non-homogenous is a higher risk of malignant transformation, but they can be very variable in clinical presentation. Okay. Um, and uh, I will demonstrate. So here, this one in the previous slide, sorry. In the previous slide, it mentioned fissuring, that it, you can have a white plaque with or without fissuring. And I'm gonna show it to you in the next picture. But here's an example of an erythroleukoplakia, right? So we have this white component, we have some of the red component and there's actually an ulcer here. So this would be a very high risk. Um, lesion. It's in a high risk site, which is the tongue. The tongue and the floor of mouth are a very high risk site for oral cancer. Um, so if you have a leukoplakia and erythroleukoplakia, especially if it's ulcerated, that is like screaming to you, this might be cancer. Um, so these are examples of non homogeneous. But do you see here on this portion, we have a very well demarcated leukoplakia or erythroleukoplakia, because we have this red component, you're able to see it, you can hallucinate, but I will guarantee you there's an ulcer right here, because this is my patient, it's very small, but there's an ulcer here. But right here, there are some, there's some fissuring. And this fissuring is different from a reticulation that we saw in lichen planus. And this is important distinction, sometimes it's hard to see those differences when you haven't seen a whole bunch of these cases. And a lot of people confuse lichen planus with leukoplakia because they see these kind of lines and like, is that a reticulation? But it's actually a fissure uh, within a leukoplakia but, and not a reticulation of lichen planus. And then people are thinking it's, you know, lichen planus, which has a much lower malignant transformation rate than a leukoplakia. Okay, so it's important to keep uh, uh, to understand those differences so that we're actually following and, and um, having more appropriate risk uh, assessments for patients and appropriate diagnoses. So some of the things that people might confuse leukoplakias for is leukedema when it's on the um, buccal mucosa or frictional keratosis. Now someone might think, oh, maybe they just, you know, bit 
were biting their tongue quite hard. But if you look, if you think about these leukoplakids, they're very sharply demarcated. Right, we, we saw, it. we were talking about how we can tell where it starts and when it stops. And you think about it, if someone is to bite their tongue repeatedly, the chances that you would bite it in the same spot, the same intensity every single time is extremely low. So it's probably not from fiction. If you have something that is so well demarcated, you should think leukoplakia versus a frictional type of lesion, okay? Um, candidiasis. We're going to talk about candidiasis a little bit later because um, you see something white in the mouth. First thing a lot of people think about candida. Um, if it doesn't wipe off, it cannot be candida. Um, there's like one subtype that's extremely rare, but so this not candidiasis, this is stuck on there. It's a plaque, okay, not a pseudomembrane that we would expect in candida. Um, hairy leukoplakia. Hairy leukoplakia is a only presents in this vertical pattern. We're here um, and only on the lateral border of the tongue. And this is very diffuse on the ventral border of the tongue. You wouldn't have a red component. You wouldn't have um, ulceration. I mean, yeah, you wouldn't have ulceration and considering all the medical history. Lichen planus, we already talked a little bit about that. And then GVHD. GVHD is a very, very interesting one. Uh, well, obviously we'd have to have a medical history. But GVHD looks exactly like lichen planus clinically in the mouth, just like lichen planus gone wild. But with GVHD, you can have leukoplakias intermixed with GVHD. So that becomes very, very tricky for, um, for you to monitor. So I would highly recommend if your patient has chronic GVHD that you get someone with experience looking in the mouth to monitor for them developing leukoplakias or oral cancer because it's really hard to tell GVHD apart from leukoplakias and their risk for malignancy is very high, um, even the further they're out from their transplant. So that's just a little plug for that. And our hospital-based um, residencies, we see GVHD patients all the time. Okay, so how do we, once a diagnosis, we talked about it being um, a diagnosis of exclusion. So we're going, it's going to be based on the history, the clinical presentation. And we talked about a biopsy is necessary. As soon as you see um, leukoplakia, you must biopsy to get a sense, is this um, lesion dysplastic or not? If it's not dysplastic, well, it wasn't dysplastic that day, but there is a chance still that there may be dysplasia later on. This patient must be on a close follow-up schedule. Um, we typically see them every three months and we're monitoring for changes in size, appearance, um, nodularity, uh, progression of that lesion. Um, but whenever it's possible, you know, this one is quite, large, this leukoplake is going all the way back here. It's humongous. So whenever it's possible, we try to excise the lesion, but sometimes it's hard to justify. You have a mild dysplasia. I'm going to do a partial vasectomy and do a radial forearm um, graft when it's not cancer yet, and that becomes difficult. So whenever it's possible, we try to excise it, but that's the importance of catching these things on uh, very early and having an accurate diagnosis the first time we see it, okay? All right, now a subtype of leukoplakia is something called proliferative varicose leukoplakia. And this one is very, very tricky. It's a type of non-homogeneous leukoplakia and it's multifocal. It's progressive in nature, the, hence the proliferative. Um, we also don't know why some people develop this. Um, it's more common in females, no racial predilection, and the mean age at the time of diagnosis is in the seventh decade. And the surprising thing is two thirds of people who develop this have never smoked, um, no substantial association with alcohol consumption, so they don't have the classic risk factors for leukoplakia and oral cancer. They look like leukoplakias, but as the name suggests too, they tend to be more varicose. Um, in nature and extens extensive, and they really like to be on the gingiva. So when you have proliferative varicose leukoplakia, 
at least one of those is going to be on the gingiva most of the time. Um, but because they're multifocal in nature and they're white and they're affecting the gingiva, they're affecting the buccal mucosa, they're affecting the tongue, many times they're confused for oral lichen planus because of this widespread distribution and you know these plaque changes. Um, so the diagnosis tends to be retrospective because patient develops one lesion and then they develop another and then they develop another. Then you're like, oh, this is not just any leukoplakia. It's a proliferative varicose leukoplakia. Um, usually the first time you biopsy this patient, they're not going to show any dysplasia on the, the specimens. The, the leukoplakias tend to be quite benign, if you will. Um, but as the time goes on, you're just waiting for them to develop carcinoma. The malignant transformation rate is around 50%. So they will develop cancer at some point. Um, it's a very frustrating diagnosis to give patients. Um, and it's difficult to manage these patients because what are you gonna do? You're just gonna chase it. Actually, one of the characteristics is you remove what that helps you make this diagnosis too is eyes one of those leukoplakias and they just come right back, same spot. I should have put one of these pictures, a patient, actually the first, the, I'll show this one, this, this patient, I took a biopsy right from here and on post-op, it was back. In two weeks, it was completely back. So, and that was a patient with proliferous leukoplakia. So this is something to really be aware of um, and to not get confused with oral lichen planus. Um, this is a case of a patient who had been given a diagnosis of oral lichen planus and had just been treated with steroids. And here's the other, the other issue. Because sometimes you can have that erythro, um, that erythematous component. So she had like a proliferative um, erythroleukoplakia. Uh, they, they thought that she had oral lichen planus and had been given her steroids. And if you biopsy some of these areas that have some of that erythematous component, you can have a little bit of a lichenoid reaction on the histology, but it's not lichen planus. Um, and it might, but on the sign out, it might say that there's a, a lymphocytic infiltrate, but that doesn't mean someone has lichen planus because lichen planus is a clinical diagnosis, right? Um, and for two years, she was going around being like, this is, you know, this is not just my lichen planus, there's something else going on. And she came to me like this, and this was a squamous cell carcinoma that had been going on for at least a year. So, and she thought she had lichen planus all the time, or that's what everybody just kept telling her. So this is just to, and you see it's, you know, bilateral symmetric, red and white, and how you might realize that someone could confuse those two things. Okay, so moving on to oral cancer. Um, the classic risk factors, tobacco, alcohol, immunosuppressive conditions, and the oral potentially malignant disorders that we mentioned, some of them, right? Graft versus host disease, leukoplakia, lichen planus. Um, the tongue and floor of mouth are the more common sites, are high risk sites. Uh, most of the time, oral cancer is asymptomatic, the, the initial lesion. Um, they, when it's symptomatic, usually it's going to be a later stage diagnosis. Um, commonly, it's going to present as an ulcer, a nodule, or a mass that is indurated. Um, if you have an ulcer with a rolled border, that is highly suspicious for squamous cell carcinoma. Um, the most common thing for people to confuse oral cancer for is a traumatic lesion. So we have our golden rule. If you think there is, if you think it's caused by trauma, you remove whatever trauma you think it was. If you remove the source of trauma and that lesion does not go away after two weeks, you take a biopsy. That's, that's the rule that we follow. Um, so this patient, I'll uh, highlight, well, this one was the proliferative uh, varicose leukoplakia that I just showed you. 
this patient was a like 48 year old male who only used smokeless tobacco and drank a six pack a night. Um, so, you know, if you go out in the literature and if you, you know, read things, they'll say, oh, smokeless tobacco is the least, uh, is the safest, quote unquote, right, form of, of tobacco use. That's all he did, smokeless tobacco, but he drank a six pack with potentiates the, the, the penetration of the tobacco. And he had a T4 um, squamous cell carcinoma there in the vestibule. That, the alveolar bone was like cottage cheese. I mean, it was just nothing there in a very young patient lost his, had a hemimandibulectomy from that. This patient thought that, you know, she was biting her tongue, like she had a new crown, part of the crown chipped off um, when she started developing this. And honestly, if you looked at that, it would make sense. Even this like little rim, this is what we called a rule. This is what we call a little bit of a rolled border. And it would make sense, like the whole story made sense. But you know, they shaved down the tooth and it didn't go away. So we have to take a biopsy. And on the biopsy, it was cancer. So these are more like impressive looking, more impressive looking cancers. And this is a more like run of the mill, kind of surprised a little bit that it was cancer. Okay. And feel free to like interject, ask questions. So since we were talking about oral cancer, uh, Dr. Tabares and I uh, are the main organizers of the oral cancer walk here in San Antonio. Um, UT Health Dentistry, in partnership with the Oral Cancer Foundation, we put this event together every year. We did it last year in April, which is the Oral Cancer Awareness Month, but this year we will do it in October. So hopefully we will see some of you there. And um, yeah, well, oral cancer is real. And we see it, unfortunately, all the time. If you have patients with ulcerations in the mouth that haven't healed, hasn't healed in two weeks, um, that's a, a good indication for referral to the dentist or oral medicine specialist. Um, the other condition we wanted to talk is oral candidiasis. As you have seen, we use candidiasis as a differential, as a differential diagnosis for many of the previous conditions, right? Why? Because it's common, because it's white. Uh, and the patients, they have knowledge and awareness of this condition. They, they go to Google and they put something white in the mouth and maybe the first thing that is going to pop is thrush, oral thrush, something like that. Uh, it's not always oral candidiasis and hopefully we can give you here some tips uh, uh, to differentiate one condition from the other. Um, oral candidiasis is the most common uh, superficial fungal infection affecting the mouth. It's caused by Candida, the most common one in the mouth is going to be Candida albicans. 50% um, of people, 30 to 50% of, of people has Candida already in the mouth. Half of us is going, we're going to have Candida in our mouth. That doesn't mean that we have the infection, but we are carriers of the microorganism. Some of the risk factors to develop oral candidiasis is going to be immunosuppression. Okay, remember that this is an opportunistic infection. Uh, the, 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 the integrity of the mucosa of the mouth, patients with lichen planus or other conditions that are going to affect the topography or integrity of the mucosa, they're going to have higher risk. Patients um, with oral dryness, patients that are very dry, that also makes it perfect environment for, for the candida to, to create an infection. We have different types of candidiasis, uh, pseudomembranous candidiasis, is these white foamy lesions that you can wipe off. And it's kind of like the most dramatic presentation and everybody always remember that type of candidiasis because it's so distinctive, okay? White foamy lesions, you, wipe, you, you, get a, you, you grab a gauze and you, you, you rub it and you will get all that white stuff in the gauze, okay? And what is leaving behind is just very red mucosa. But that's actually one of the least common type of candidiasis. We also have the erythematous or atrophic candidiasis, and that can present as, as an angular calitis. And I'm, I'm going to show you, you pictures of that. That's affecting the corners of the mouth that are going to be very red and sometimes fissure. When the patients open wide, the fissures can open. It's going to be painful. Uh, we also have the central papillary 
um, atrophy or the median rhomboiglossitis that's going to affect the tongue, as the name says. And we also have denture systematitis. That's the one that is related to the patients wearing dentures when they don't clean the, the dentures well or when they sleep with the dentures on. Um, they are prone to develop this type of uh, candidiasis. And the last one is the least common of them all, and it's called hyperplastic candidiasis. I'm not sure if we have a picture here, but that one really resembles a leukoplakia because that one is going to be a white plaque that you cannot rub off. That one, as, as I said already, is very rare. And when it happens, most of the times it's affecting the vocal mucosa, the cheeks, very close to the corners of the mouth. Um, the diagnosis, the clinical presentation is more than enough. Again, be mindful that the patient can present with different type of, of candidiasis. The culture is not really diagnostic because uh, you're going to be culturing, but the patient can be uh, a carrier. And uh, cytology can be helpful sometimes when the, when the diagnosis is kind of ambiguous. So these two pictures that we saw here are um, serum remanus candidiasis. Most of the times you will see these white formulations. They are not to be one to two millimeters in areas where um, there is not that much movement, maybe in the vestibule, maybe in the, in, in the soft palate. So the microorganism has enough time to create these colonies. Very difficult to see these type of lesions, maybe in the dorsal tongue, because every time you swallow, you speak, you chew, the tongue is in constant contact with food or your palate, so it's more difficult to have those lesions there. So really always look into the folds of the mouth, in the floor of the mouth, in the vestibule, those are the most common locations for these type of, of candidiasis. As I said before, this picture, the first picture is the angular chylitis. We see these erythematous lesions here, sometimes are fissure, very painful when the patients open wide. And this is the median rhomboid glossitis. Um, sometimes we can also have what we call the kissing lesions when the tongue is resting in resting position, the tongue is touching the palate. So if you have a candidate infection on your tongue or in your palate, you're going to have it also in, 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 the, other, in the other location, okay? Um, we treat these conditions uh, most of the times with topical antifungals. We can prescribe an nystatin as an oral suspension for the patient to uh, use it as a rinse, as a mouthwash four times a day for two weeks. Um, or we can also prescribe clotrimazole as a lozenger for the patient to use it five times a day for two weeks. Fluconazole is the easiest because it's just a, a pill that the patient can take for, for 10 days, only once a day, easy to prescribe. Miconazole is another option that we have. So other conditions, super, super common, recurrent after systematitis. Um, let me just, this is also, known as uh, canker sores or recurrent aftas ulcers. This is the most common type of ulcer ulcerative condition affecting the mouth. Maybe half of you had had it before. This is a very painful condition. You have like a one or two millimeter ulceration in your mouth and it feels like it's something huge. You can even talk, speak, swallow. It's awful and it, it's just a, a, a tiny lesion ulceration in your mouth. The Pathophysiology of this condition is T cell mediated. It's a reaction um, with production of TNF alpha that is targeted to the epithelial cells, and that's what's creating these ulcerations in the mouth. Affects 20% of the general population, and the prevalence is even higher when there is a positive family history of recurrent after systematitis. This condition is more common in younger patients, uh, 40 years old or younger, with a peak between 10 in 19 years old. One of the important things about recurrent after systematitis, as the name says, it has to be recurrent. It has to be cyclic. When you have a patient that is in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and they come to you, um, most likely is not going to be recurrent after systematitis. For this to be recurrent after systematitis, as I said, it has to be cyclic and recurrent, and the patient should be otherwise healthy, because we have other conditions that can have a similar presentation, but those are going to be related to something else, and we will see that in a little bit. So recurrence of stomatitis is kind of easy to diagnose because these ulcers are going to be circular, round, or elliptical. They are jello because that's the fibrin that is very superficial, and they have what we call the 
erythematous halo is like the, the redness, the rim is going to be very red. And these uh, ulcers are going to be uh, are going to be in non-keratinized mucosa. Non-keratinized mucosa is the soft mucosa, the flexible mucosa of the mouth, your lips, your cheeks, your tongue, the floor of the mouth. You won't see this in the keratinized mucosa, for example, the gingiva or the palate, that's the hard mucosa of your mouth. You won't see, um, in most cases, uh, a recurrent astrosomatitis affecting those locations. It can present in different ways. We classify it as a minor, major, or herpetiform. The minor presentation is the most common one. These are the one to five millimeter, millimeter ulcerations in the non-keratinized mucosa. You can have one or two. The major ones, of course, are going to be up to one centimeter. Um, those ones are not always super circular or round. They can have kind of like a different shape but most of the times they uh, preserve that 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 configuration um, and the the pattern that is the least common is the herpetiform it looks like herpes but it's not herpes there is not herpes involved it's just that the clinic the clinical presentation resembles an hsb infection um, most of the times patients are familiar with this so they know they have been dealing with this since they are younger. Maybe they have a family member that also has the same condition. So maybe they won't even go to you unless they're having an exacerbation. The lesions are bigger or are more common, more frequent, are taking longer to heal. Typically, this condition is self-limiting and takes seven to 10 days to heal. So again, if it's been two, three weeks, four weeks, and the, the, the ulceration is unique, it's an, a single ulcer, and it's in the mouth, and maybe the patient never had it before, it's, and it's in one of the high-risk locations for oral cancer, so maybe we should start thinking about something else. Um, so as I said before, the diagnosis is clinical based on the history, should be recurrent and, and, and cyclic, and initial presentations require further investigation because some of the differential diagnosis are going to include Bechet's, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, celiac disease, nutritional deficiencies, and, and cyclic neutropenia, and those are things that we need to investigate. Again, if you have a 60, 70 years old patient that have never experienced this before, so start thinking out of the box, maybe it's just not recurring after stomatitis. For the management, it really depends on the symptoms. As I said before, this is self-limiting patients know seven to 10 days, they heal, but if not, we can use topical steroids. Again, this is off-label. We can use magic mouthwash. Personally, I don't like the magic mouthwash too much because that's only numbing the patient's mouth. It's just a combination of different things that is treating everything but anything. And um, you, you, you don't really know what's going on. Um, the patient keeps using it forever because it feels good for maybe 10, 15 minutes, uh, but really the patient is not, is not getting any, any, any better, okay? We can also use combinations of things like the magic mouthwash and oral um, dexamethasone as an oral solution. Uh, it can be very helpful. Also, uh, anti-inflammatory medications like Amlexanox, 5% paste is not super popular, but it's out there. Um, and in more severe cases, these patients need uh, systemic therapy with different agents. Other common condition, HSV. Um, this is herpes. Uh, in the case of the mouth, it's most commonly associated to HSV-1. Um, is this, this is an in, in a, a viral infection um, that is transmitted through saliva, very, very common. We can have the primary infection that most of the times is, is asymptomatic, and then this go, is, goes to a, a state of latency, and then we can have the secondary uh, herpes or the recurrent presentation. Um, as I said, most of the times the, the, the primary infection is asymptomatic, but when it's not asymptomatic, it's going to present like this first picture here, and we call it um, herpetic gingivostomatitis. Is We will see these ulcerations affecting the mucosa of the mouth. In this case, it's going to affect keratinized and non-keratinized mucosa. You remember that with the, recur with the recurrent after stomatitis was only non-keratinized mucosa. Okay, but in this case, you will have ulcerations everywhere in the mouth. These patients are going to have 
prodromal and constitutional symptoms because this is a, a viral infection. Um, so I said that the primary most of the time is asymptomatic, then the patient goes in, in latency, and then we can have this secondary reactivation, and the secondary reactivation can be triggered by UV lights, uh, friction, heat in the area. When the patients go to the dentist, it's very common to a few days later, they, they're going to have these lesions in the mouth, um, emotional and physical stress, trauma, fever, menstruation, and so many other things. Um, the primary presentation is more common in, in children from six months to five years. And the secondary is, of course, in older, older patients, 15 to 45% of um, Americans adults have been exposed and they have secondary HSV infections. Um, these ones um, are going to start, this, let, let's talk about the, the, the primary, um, are going to start with the prodromal symptoms, of course, and then the patient is going to have these red patches that then become papules, ulcers, and these, um, sorry, papules, vesicles, and then the vesicle because it's in the mouth and the membrane is super, super thin and fragile just by movement of the mucosa and eating, speaking, swallowing, it bursts, leaving behind an ulceration that is very, very painful. In the secondary, and here we have two examples. This is in keratinized mucosa. As I said before, we have this ulceration here. We can see that the, 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 that the borders are more irregular when we compare to the recurrent aftosomatitis. The recurrent aftosomatitis is very circular. This one is like more irregular and we see other associated lesions like here, this is a tiny one, and maybe this is another a small one here that is, is starting to coalesce and that's why the ulcer looks bigger. Uh, when it affects the lips, we call it recurrent herpes labialis, very common. Maybe you have seen these patients. Uh, we're going to have this swelling on the lips, and we're going to see the vesicles that then they burst, leaving behind an ulceration that it dries, and we're going to have crust. In the mouth, since the mouth is a wet environment, we don't have any crusting, but in the lips, it's very common to see the crusting. Um, the differential diagnosis is with recurrent aftosomatitis. Um, again, I already give you the tips how to differentiate one from another. If you have a patient with confirmed herpetic uh, gingivostomatitis, um, you need to investigate more looking for immunosuppressions. It's very rare having an adult uh, that have been, never been exposed to HSV before. Um, so yeah, that's something uh, to take into consideration. For the management in the primary children is with uh, a cyclovir. You have the prescription there and also controlling pain and fever with acetaminophen and other NSAIDs and uh, monitor hydration uh, in, in, in this um, because they don't want to eat because it's very painful. Uh, we can also prescribe viscous lidocaine or some topical benzocaine to control pain. In the secondary type, a cyclovir ointment or pencyclovir ointment, those are prescriptions, but the conazole 10%, that's over the counter, is FDA approved, brand name is Abriva, and they can apply it in the, in the lips. Erythema multiforme, three more minutes. So maybe we won't have time to cover, we, we don't have many other conditions. Erythema multiforme, um, it has a unique clinical presentation. If you're looking at the pictures right now, we're going to have this crusty of the lips, and this has been associated to herpes and myco mycoplasma pneumoniae, but also some medications is less common, but we can see that it related to medication. This is a hypersensitivity reaction also, very painful. Um, some of the conditions um, for differential diagnosis, pemphigus vulgaris and mucous membrane pemphigoid, those are things that seems like super rare and sometimes are described like rare disorder diseases, but we see it every day in our clinic. In fact, we were trained in the Northeast. I, I went to Philadelphia, she went to Boston, and um, we have noticed a higher incidence and prevalence of pemphigus and pemphigoid here in South Texas. We're not sure why, but it's, it's very common. Dry mouth, this is another condition that your patients might report. My mouth is dry and you are like, okay, what, what can I do for you? I don't, you know? Um, the most common cause of oral dryness is going to be polypharm. If a patient is taking more than five medications, I already consider that the patient needs polypharm and, 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 and might have oral dryness, but we need to consider other things, including Sjogren's syndrome, okay? And some other systemic diseases, uh, 
that 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 if they are not well controlled, like diabetes, can also present with oral dryness. Burning mouth syndrome, a very few patients still knows and understand the condition. Uh, patient is going to report burning sensation most of the time of the tongue, but it can also present in the palate, lips, and vocal mucosa in the absence of oral lesions. So this is a patient that tells you my tongue burns, and when you open the mouth, you don't see much going on there, okay? So this is a syndrome, and syndromes mean that there are other symptoms associated. So the most common ones is going to be oral dryness, and it's going to be the changes in taste or decusia. Uh, we wanted to present this to you because this paper report that 51% of the patients with these symptoms, the first place they go is to the primary care physician. Okay, they also go to the gastroenterologist, ENT, oral surgeons, but they don't have a definitive diagnosis or or, or treatment um, until they see someone that knows about the, this condition, and it's often confused by candidiasis or other viral infections. We wanted to thank you. I have to rush through the end of the presentation. Hopefully this was beneficial for you. If you have patients uh, with weird things in the mouth, feel free to send these patients to us. We are in UT Health Dentistry, the oral medicine clinic. Um, if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer the questions. If not, thank you for your attention. If y'all don't do an excisional no, biopsy. We, we are in the have... process of uh, taking medical insurance uh, in the dental school or particular clinic. We don't take um, dental insurance. The, the, or diagnosis or medical diagnosis. So it makes more sense to us to, to accept um, medical insurance, but it's a long process. Thank you. Questions for anyone listening to this or can't say who's a great topic on the chat there. Thank you. Okay. Um, that will conclude for today then for the grand rounds. For those who were here, if you could please take a moment, there's a QR code um, on the um, right-hand side of the little half sheet. If you could provide feedback for our speakers, please. Um, but I believe y'all are